One day, one of my son David's ninth grade teachers told him, his class, that all soldiers are murderers. I told my son that I disagreed, but did not take the time to explain in detail why I felt that way. Today I'm going to try to discuss my feelings about the matter. I hope to tell here what we were and what we felt. commentator is Joe O'Brien. Here is the motion picture record released by the United States Navy of the havoc wrought by the Japs' sneak sky and sea raid on Pearl Harbor, America's mid-Pacific naval bastion. On December 7, 1941, Japan, like its infamous Axis partners, struck first and declared war afterwards. Uh, I was home <laughs> uh, in uh, Harrisburg, living on the street. It was a Sunday, of course, and uh, uh, I think we I'm very hazy as to, I think my father was washing the car, even though it was December, he was washing the car, and uh, it was just a normal Sunday, we were reading the Sunday paper, which of course Pearl Harbor wasn't in the paper yet, and the radio announcement came over, I guess, I don't remember much about that, but uh, it made a sensation that afternoon, but it, I don't remember any unusual thinking. Uh, I don't know if you have another question about that, but uh, the big time for me uh, with Pearl Harbor was the next day. I had a friend that often stopped at my house. He lived on Front Street and uh, walked all the way from John Harris to Front Street to get home. And uh, he often stopped at our house, and Monday afternoon, coming home, we had heard the declaration of war from, or the request for a declaration of war from, from uh, Roosevelt at the school auditorium. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy, the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. But uh, my friend had dropped into our house in the afternoon and we played one of our many games of Monopoly and turned the radio on. And it was interesting what was going on. Uh, all the countries in the world seemed to be declaring war. Uh, among them, China. China had been invaded by Japan in 1936, but that Monday afternoon after Pearl Harbor, uh, they were announcing on the news that China had declared war on Japan, mainly because we were then in a war. But other countries, it sticks in my mind, Argentina did, although they were pro-Nazi later. I don't, don't know if they joined the war on our side or not, but I remember the name Argentina being heard. Um, but uh, it just seemed that afternoon, all the countries in the world seemed to be declaring war at this late date, mainly because of Pearl Harbor. That was my main chief reaction, other than the Roosevelt uh, thing that morning.
hundred million of us, men and women of working and fighting age. To fight this war, 10 million more people must go to work by the end of 1943. Before the war, half of us worked. The other 50 million kept house, went to school, played, or looked for work. Today, employment offices are deserted. I would have trouble thinking of any. Uh, at the time, I was, of course, going to school. And my main part-time job was being usher at one of the theaters in downtown Harrisburg. Uh, but I... I don't remember taking part in any drives or any uh, any activities that had to do with with participating in the war. I considered, or most of us would have considered me too young to join the war at the time, and we therefore were still spectators. Uh, there was not a great deal of uh, talk daily about what teenagers should be doing to support the war. Uh, but, uh, so my answer, I guess, was, uh, what activities was I doing? Nothing, really. In my senior year at John Harris, we had a special assembly for seniors at which they informed us that we could either enter, could enter college in January of the senior year if we had a B average and were accepted at the college of our choice. The colleges were hard up for students because many college students had been drafted or had enlisted. Students had not been notified, or parents had not been notified of this offer. That evening, at the supper table, I told my parents about the offer. They heard me out and then went on to talk about other things. I asked them what we were going to do about the college offer. My father said, Oh, you're going to college. In July, I reported for my physical exam and possible induction. The only thing physically wrong with me was my eyesight. 2200 without glasses. As the examiner stamped that on my papers, I asked what that meant. He said that it means you'll never see combat. While sitting in a foxhole many months later, I reflected that he might have meant that with my eyesight I would never actually see combat, but would possibly be in it. Whether see or be, I was good enough physically to serve and to put up my right hand and was sworn in. We, uh, we had two kinds of rations. When we crossed the Rhine, Patton announced that the Third Army would live on rations from then on to the end of the war, so we could move fast. There were two kinds of rations. The sea rations, which were cans, like a can of beans or a can of spaghetti or something like that. Uh, they could be heated if you had a fire or stove or something around. And we had those in our packs. Uh, and the others, more common, were the K rations. The K-ration box was most like a Cracker Jack box, roughly that size. And it contained, most often, I mean, I, I don't know if in every box was that way, but the ingredients I remember were a large chunk of cheese, a packet of lemon aid powder, um, some crackers maybe, and uh, I mean I remember the powder, I remember the cheese. Cheese was always an ingredient. 
and there was sometimes a, a miniature Hershey bar, a piece of chocolate that was made in such a way that it didn't melt easily, so it was a, a different kind of chocolate than we usually eat now. Mm -hmm. It was sort of a hard composition chocolate. But uh, the K, I, I like the K rations, <laughs> I like the cheese and stuff. And uh, it was enough to fill you. I mean, it was uh, constituted, I guess, with the proper balance of volume or of vitamins and uh, things. But uh, it was in a Cracker Jack type box, and it was uh, uh, wax on the outside so that it was waterproof. And uh, but when we had the time, we we uh, cooked uh, a meal with the K-rations, and I remember a can of beans, a can of spaghetti, a can of, I uh, uh, can't think, of, there, was, there were about six or seven different kinds of, of C-rations. Um, living in uh, foxholes, and I, meant, I thought you were leading up to how did we uh, spend the night in them. Uh, so I might mention that now, that when you're in the foxholes, quite often when we had the time, there were two men to a foxhole. And you took turns sleeping. Uh, this was at night only. Um, you would be awake two hours by yourself and then you would sleep for two hours while your buddy slept, or uh, stood guard more or less, but you were down in the foxhole. And uh, of course you were, you didn't talk because you were, you were on a defensive position. You were, you were, uh, this is nighttime. Uh, they could sneak up on you and I think the Japs did this more than the Germans that uh, would come up behind you or and slit your throat before you knew what was happening or something, but uh, I never encountered an enemy in the foxhole. I fired from it at a distant enemy, but I never had one in my foxhole with me. <laughs> uh, but that was living in a foxhole, and as I said in the, in the main story, I. Somehow the way I was built, it was agony for me to, to be digging. And even though I could really march with the best of them, walk with the best of them all over Europe, but uh, I didn't take to, to uh, when you were just after we crossed the Moselle, um, the ground was in the sort of forest we were in was littered with uh, with tree roots and I was, had to dig down through the tree roots uh, to, we weren't equipped with axes mostly, and uh, we had to dig down through these roots to dig foxhole. Well, I sometimes would dig rather shallow foxholes rather than go through the agony of digging down deeply which when the resistance was bad, but uh, I hated digging them and I hated, uh, I minded a little bit less staying in them. I guess I've answered all the food yeah. questions. Oh, Sorry. oh, one other big thing of the food was uh, if there was a nature that we were pulling up into a town or something like that, uh, we seemed to always have a number of men in our outfit that that were had been cooks for themselves when they were civilians, and uh, they would go looking for chickens, live chickens, and uh, uh, other food like that. I had a favorite in that final farmhouse I lived in of. I went through, they had a 
cold storage place, and in there they had uh, just cold storied strawberries, just in, in water, evidently, and but they were sealed in in jars and preserved. And I thought they were the greatest thing. Uh, but I had a lot of strawberries, but uh, I remember at that same time the guy bringing in chickens and and killing them and then we taking turns of helping ourselves to what was on top of the stove of the newly fried chicken, which was often very good. <laughs> but uh, that was another source of food. But um, even before Patton said we were going to live on K rations and C rations, we had been given rations from time to time. Uh, and had eaten them on the other side of the Rhine. But uh, he, he declared that we would move faster if we had the rations in our pack. That was one of those cases where we weren't overly prepared. Uh, everything was new in that. I mean, at no time in basic training had we been in a rowboat or across water or anything like that. And uh, so it was all new that night. I mean, we were told, go down to the shore, get yourself a boat, and take it out to the water. And that was the first uh, thing. And as I say, there were 13 of us. And I remember that so vividly because a friend of mine said, this was his birthday, it was the 13th of the month, and uh, he was very much concerned with all the times number 13 appeared, uh, and this is what we were talking about on the shore. And then we were getting into the, to the boats, and I'm a little vague how, the, how it was steered, but I knew there were six on a side, and we had no practice in rowing a boat. I had probably never, I had never rowed a, I, well, I guess on Hershey I had rowed a boat. But um, it was a new experience. So we were living in the present, how to boat, how to steer it, how to get it across. Then we were aware of the shots firing over. And as I said, it was that night that I heard some troops screaming on the other side. I don't know what was happening over there, but that concerned me more than anything. <laughs> this screaming coming out of the dark on the other side ahead of us where we were headed. <laughs> um, with the bullets coming over our head, I, I guess we were accustomed to bullets coming over our head, Eisenach and many other places. Many times the bullets came over our head, and that that didn't frighten me all that much. I mean, as I said, we were busy with the rowing, busy with what was going to be. We weren't told that we were going to have to climb a hill on the other side, uh, or what the fighting would be like on the other side. Um, so we didn't really have time to think much about that. The idea was to get across that water and not get sunk. <laughs> and uh, then I was thinking of, of the screaming I heard on the other side and thinking there must be something terrible going on. But that's, that's what it was like when past the water. Finally, one day in early May, they told us that we were going back into combat the next day. The next morning, we lined up to move out, all packed up and ready to go. When over the radio came the voice of Winston Churchill, saying the war with Germany was over. We didn't move out that day, but days later moved close to the German border where we hunted for deer and had those pictures that William showed you developed.
When I was in Lafayette before entering the Army, I majored in engineering. One of the courses I especially liked was surveying, where we measured and mapped the campus. Map is the campus. In France, after the war, they put up a notice of an advanced course in surveying in a college in England, free to a GI who qualified. This sounded like fun, so I went up to the regimental headquarters to apply and possibly be interviewed. When I went in for the interview, the interviewer looked at me and asked if I had heard the news. When I nodded no, he practically shouted, they have dropped a bomb on Japan that has wiped out a whole city. They think it might force Japan to surrender. We'll probably be going home soon. I don't think you'll want to hang around here for a college course. With divisions going through France every day on the way to the Pacific, I had thought that the war was far from over. At the time, I only knew what he told me, but it sounded like it was possible that it might be soon over, and agreed that I would not, should not apply for the course. I had been developing an interest in psychology, and when I got home announced that I was going to college, not in engineering, but in psychology. So you might say that the atom bomb changed the course of my life. Some of your questions were about my reactions to the atomic bomb, so you probably deserve more than my conversion to psychology. First, I knew nothing about the bomb till I was told in the interview, and most of us knew little more than I learned that day. I didn't get Life magazine while overseas, and from radio, we were told little more than that the bomb was powerful. Well, I guess the, the biggest, of course, would have been uh, D-Day, which came quite a bit later when I was in the Army. But uh, we were all interested in what D-Day would be and how extensive the war would be and whether uh, the Allies would would manage to completely defeat Germany at that time, or uh, whether we would be defeated at uh, the D-Day beaches. But uh, I would say probably that was the biggest event of World War II that that I was aware of. That uh, the, the invasion of D-Day was a very important part of the World War II and the fact that we did win it, uh, bloody as it was, uh, was very important. Uh, no, indeed. <laughs> as I made it out in my main speech, I had long since become aware of Hitler. Uh, I guess you could say I wasn't all that clear why we were at war with Japan or why they even attacked us because I knew very little about Japan's concerns in the Pacific. But I knew Hitler, I knew how he had progressed in conquering most of Europe and his attitude toward other races. And so uh, I had no doubt that we should be fighting him, and I had no doubt in the years before Pearl Harbor, as I followed Hitler's progress, it, that he was something we should be fighting against at some time, whether it was later in my teens, or whether it was then, or whether it had been earlier. I didn't think that the day there was any doubt that the day would come when I would uh, be fighting Hitler. I'm often asked if I was afraid. I don't know of a soldier who wasn't. 
After a major battle, or when the time was right, our company or battalion or regiment would go into reserve to rest up. There were levels of reserve. At one level we had to be ready for action at a moment's notice. At others, the release was complete and we would really relax. It was in reserve that I felt the most fear. There you had time to think about what you had been through and what you might be asked to go through in the future. In most combat, you were usually too busy to have time to think of possible things.